Knee vent. <laughs> Here we go. Got it. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome aboard again, you sky gazers, potential <laughs> new members of the SBAU, and welcome aboard. It's our weekly SBAU Astro Hour online, a blog podcast we've been doing almost a year and a half straight from our computer dens and man caves for the South Coast Longtime Astronomy and Telescope Club, the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. Uh, it's based up at our beautiful Museum of Natural History. Haven't met there in a while. Hopefully get back this fall. I'm VP of the club, thankfully. Mr. Heron, Ron Heron, used to interview these very knowledgeable gents you're seeing on the screen with me on the radio. But back then it was every two weeks and we had to stop for commercials. We decided let's do it online. This episode number 77, that's how many weeks we've been doing it, Monday mornings at 11 a.m. Uh, featuring these possible topics and headlines. We start out with a full moon. At least I like to go out piecemeal, just keep going. Start with a full moon. It'll be full, I guess, in about a week and a half. It's uh, approaching. Wait, wait, wait. No, it was just, it was just, just full. full. Yeah, a full last was, Friday. Well, last it was Friday. full. Now it's waxing. It'll be the Wayne. first quarter it's, this Friday. Oh, the first, you know what? I've got. Oh, excuse quarter. me, last quarter. Oh, okay. So it's still waning. Yes. Is it waning? It's certainly waning over in the desert in Death Valley. Looks like uh, Chuck has beamed up. <laughs> Because <laughs> anyway, these are the headlines: uh, Mars, Saturn, Venus, uh, Mercury. We're going to see the visible planets. We're going to get more on the summer triangle. Uh, is there a visible huge galaxy out there in the sky that might be heading straight toward us, or unless it changed its direction? And should we be obeying Kepler's laws, or can you break them? <laughs> Let's meet the gang, um, Mr. President. After four years, everybody loves Jerry Wilson. Third season, Jerry's married to the very lovely Pat Forgy. And like the rest of us, he's working on his uh, <clears throat> uh, senility, leaving too early after <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> it's a little in there, but we'll never make that mistake again. No, the, rule is, the rule is you wait 15 minutes for a full professor, and that's well, the longest you wait. Amazingly enough, the gentleman I'm about to introduce now, our outrageously outreachable outreach coordinator, Chuck McPartland, saw you, I think, driving away. Did you know? Oh, he says. Yeah. <laughs> and you didn't think to wave him down and says, go pick up a pizza. Well, we were, we were right right on, on Foothill, climbing up past, just past the junior high. Oh. And Jerry was just starting to come down the hill. So it's not a convenient place to stop and honk. Yeah, I got to tell you, I would have felt probably the same way if I'd gotten my signals crossed, which I have. I've missed whole meetings before, didn't realize. Let's meet the other gang. Uh, since he clocked in early, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Bruce Murdoch, who's married to Bonnie, is a longtime oh. active member, president of the Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society. You with us, Bruce? Yes, I'm here. You put setting up your instrument at uh, Saturday night star parties or in your backyard or different places on the mountains? Well, with the injury that I have and the lung uh, problems that I'm having, the last thing that I want to get is COVID. So I've sort of been avoiding those things. COVID? Uh, I still wear the mask, but nobody else does. And let's do. Wait, 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 wait. We, we are all wearing masks at the, at the star party at, at the museum. Are you really? Yeah. I was, I was talking about the people I pass on the street. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. And everywhere else. Let's meet the former Westmont College science instructor who was very missed out there, editor of the SBAU newsletter, Tom Whittemore. Good morning. Married to the lovely Hello. Marine. And get into it after we have a little lightness, ladies and gentlemen, because on a regular basis, our beloved president sends us all a forward silly science cartoons which we let stack up at our inbox. And I decide, you know, there's no reason. We all decided that we couldn't share these. Ah, this one, I don't. <laughs> that's, that's backwards, isn't it? Oh, that's what yeah, affairs backwards. <laughs> yeah. Is it really? Yeah, that's part of what we're arguing about. Yeah. But the uh, Big Dipper is inside the bear, Ursa, Ursa Major. Yes. And they're fighting about it in ancient Rome. It's a big bear. No, it's not. It's a frying pan. But the also, the big dipper sticks out the rear end of the bear, not the front end. That's right. Yeah. Also, that that the moon will never be up in that area. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Many things to fight about there. Yeah. Uh, this was probably put together by the same guy that said Betelgeuse was finally. Oh, I like this one. 
Uh, good news is you didn't forget him. Look what he's wearing on his head there, on the forehead above, inside the spacesuit. His glasses, <clears throat> your shades. I can't tell you that how many times that happens to me. Where are my dark glasses? And people start giggling. Oh, here's the periodic table one. I don't have any details on this, but uh, this is a picnic table, uh, periodically laid out. Similar now. What's the bench about? What what's different between the table and the bench, gentlemen? The bench are unstable radioactive elements. Oh, they don't stay in regular unison as atoms very long. They change, right? They either cell divide. There's uranium over there. Unstable, huh? Half life. Uranium, the the uh, largest uh, atomic number of a stable element. What's that again? Isn't uranium the highest number stable element? Uh, uranium's not stable. Not stable. Well, I mean, it slowly the, turns to lead with a very long half-life. Well, I understand, but uh, the further ones that have gone up the, in the periodic table, as they've discovered with atom smashers, some yeah. of them only last milliseconds. Well, not even that long. Some, some All right, nanoseconds. Yeah, tera, t uh, tera tera seconds. seconds. Yeah. Would it be fair to say that unstable means they are radiating? They're the ra radiation, uranium, cesium, yeah. radium. They, they are radioactive. They're yeah, radioactive. They kick out a neutron or something and they split. Yeah. They right. have unstable nuclei. For you folks, you flat earthers who think we staged the moon landing, here's actually what happened. Aliens faked the earth landing in uh, 1969. <laughs> they, they, they landed here and they're on the moon and you look real closely, there's got to be a monolith in there somewhere. Here we go. The discovery of the exoplanet Chorizo, which is a slice of Mexican sausage. Four other worlds have now been identified by that same silly pranking astronomer who posted the, the uh, Chorizo. This is the Bologna Galaxy. Anybody want to read those off? Bologna, Baudin Rouge, <laughs> Ilbasa, and Bratwurst. That's right. You can find those on any Saturday night star party. You know, reading of that here in a moment. That's... Oh, and there's a black hole pudding. Oh, <laughs> in the baloney galaxy. Who? What's the story? Where did that come from? I never did get that. Some guy posted a slice of something, a chorizo, as a joke. And That's then a lot of people didn't realize that it was a joke, and they criticized him for making false claims. But it was a joke from the very start. But yeah. through the air, he just said, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I just got the punchline on all the news stories. Now, what is this device called? Uh, the same number of balls that click and hit? Yeah, I don't know. I just call it a clacker. Okay, that's the clacker. And something got kicked out. If you look carefully, looks like Please there's eight, eight planets left. Are those the planets or is the sum yeah. of the balls? They should have put a heart on here so you could see that it was uh, Pluto. Yeah. Pluto. Yeah. Pluto. Pluto got kicked out. He's a dwarf planet, but he did go on to have a successful career as Mickey Mouse's dog. Right. Each, yeah. each ball transfers its momentum to the next, mm -hmm. but the end one transfers its ball, and that one has no place to transfer it, so it swings out. Well, I wish I could tell you I understood that. Oh, here we go. Werner Heisenberger participated in a track meet or something. And uh, at the Olympics, the guy said, you know what? We know for sure he won, but we don't know where Werner, Werner is. Yeah, they know his velocity, but not his position. <laughs> He's the guy that come up with the uh, quantum theory about two things. Un uncertainty think. principle. Yeah, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Okay. I've been lost in many a night of, of uh, lectures from some UCSB professors trying to explain that, and I sort of grab it. Well, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Captain President, the uh, quarter moon, I like. I kind of like to go a step at a time, just go, you know, uh, except for the uh, Webb telescope, but that's even past the moon. So we'll start with the moon, if you don't mind. That's toward the end of your talking points, Jerry. Okay. 9.36 p.m. this Thursday night, Pacific Daylight Time. It'll pass three degrees north of Mars. Even closer earlier, only 2%. Uh, the moon is northwest of Mars, high in the southwest sky. You have pictures on your talking points with this? Uh, an hour before sunup. Both are in... Oh, the yeah. Yeah, let me... I was just reading along with you, but let me show the pictures. <laughs> Both of them are in Taurus, which is just... Um, Minus 1.5, I can't read my own writing, uh, south of the Pleiades. 
the open star cluster known as M. What is the point? Forty-five. M forty-five. Okay, I don't think I took that down. Um, Moon and Mars together. Actually, we're going to also visit uh, the Venus with a beehive, Saturn rising at sunset. Here we go. And Mercury's low in the sky, parallel to the uh, horizon. What are we looking at here? Can you make that even bigger? There we go. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Half a degree, your moon. Now, who's watching it? Well, if it's half, this is, doesn't show the exact half a degree closeness, but this is the region of that air, of that event and it is at uh, august 19 at 5 30 a.m so the moon has moved away a little bit by then yeah yeah yeah, yeah and by the way venus is up at that time from our house Did okay. I put that in there it'll be down and left yep i saw it come up today at 5 36. i guess that's as far down as i went <laughs> Where are we going? Oh boy, you're cruising all over the sky. It's like a planetarium show. Um, Hopefully. It, would it be fair to say that the ecliptic of the sun, which is the plane that all the planets are in, uh, is pretty close to the ecliptic of the moon around the earth? I mean, it's well, not, it's not. The, the, it's, the, Ron, the ecliptic is the path of the sun through the sky, the apparent path of the sun through the sky from our point of view. So the, the moon does not have an ecliptic. Right. But the plane of the moon's orbit is tilted like five degrees. Right. Okay. Well, that's basically, you said it like I should have said it. I didn't realize the plane of the orbit, it's, uh, the, the word ecliptic does not apply to the moons. Right. So, so around the ecliptic, the ecliptic is the uh, plane that contains the sun and the earth. And all the other planets. No. Well, some of them are up, some of them are down. Most of them are pretty close. Yeah. Pluto is way out of the plane. You know, it's way up. It's yeah. got a smooth orbit. One of the why it's not a planet, I guess. <laughs> right. Or a planet. Well, they think it was captured, don't they not? I don't know. Well, well it was one why, of the explanations as to why it has well, such an elliptical orbit and why it's so tilted. Well, a well, lot of the a lot of the um um what is that? The Ky Kuiper belt object. Kuiper yeah. belt, yeah. A lot of the Kuiper belt have those tilted orbits. And it's, okay. it's a little odd to call it captured because it's not like it's ever been external right. to the solar That's system. That's why I said I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's all in the semantics. But out beyond that, the Oort cloud is just a big shell. There you go everywhere like an atom, don't they? Yes. Okay. Well, That's why it's so hard to find that dang ninth planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, between Bruce and Tom, I think you're the two that mostly zero in on the planets at night, right? With your telescopes? Yeah, Jupiter was uh, quite visible last night, just above the moon. I'm, I'm more into star clusters as viewed through binoculars or small small telescopes. Planets are tough for outreach right now because there's yeah. not, not a lot of them in the night in the evening sky. Right. Yeah, pretty much just Saturn, and if people stay late, then Jupiter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to wait until the moon uh, isn't in the sky, and then those will be a lot uh, clearer. Yeah. Yeah, after this Friday, I, I, in the narrative, it sa I said that um, what I consider to be the photographability of faint fuzzies is a two-week period from last quarter to first quarter. So mm -hmm. that period of astro imaging starts this Friday. Okay, well, the sun, the moon takes its time, does it not? After the sun sets, isn't it a, a while, or is that next week before it rises? When it's full, it, it rises and sets exactly opposite the sun. Now it rises very late in the night, um, and it's there in the morning um, yes. after you know after sunrise, but it sets around noon when it's at the last right. quarter. And right now the 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 um, the moon is rising roughly over the east point, roughly over the east point. Did any of you? Uh happened to see the rendering of a large meteor daytime that came in over Utah last week? Read about yeah. it, did not see a picture. Yeah. It's in my backyard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that part of the meteor shower you saw that we weren't supposed to see because of the full moon? I went out, but I didn't see anything. How about you guys? No. I we saw one at Refugio. Okay. 
Okay. Wow. And I know other people saw them and people were seeing them at the star party Saturday because I could hear oohs and ahs, but <laughs> I was mainly looking, you know, looking down, showing people things. So, yeah, yeah. How many people do you think were at our star party Saturday night, Chuck? 274. Wow. Yeah. And the first, yeah. the first dozen or two got free cookies. Yeah. <laughs> but Tom brought cookies? Uh, we had sandwiches and uh, cookies, uh, either oatmeal or, or chocolate chip. And I had two and everybody else had one or two. But they were left over from what? Another event? The they were left over from a Quasars meeting. Quasars? First time I, I thought heard. they were left over from Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got an old one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, quasars, quasars are volunteers with the museum. They tend to be teenagers. Yeah. Yeah, Chrissy explained the program to you, Ron, there like, yeah. Saturday. What they volunteer in all departments, not just uh, our department, right. But, astronomy, right. but they yeah. give them an astronomy name. Quasar. That's well, right. quasars to sea stars is the full name. Right, right. Okay. Okay. This one, I mentioned that, you know, this Friday is the Westmont Outreach. And uh, I, I wrote a little you know, so, sort of like a little target list for Scott and uh, hopefully he'll put it out on the, you know, media sites. Um, but what I was focusing on is the fact that now the summer triangle uh, is gonna be near the top of the sky during the viewing time. And it's just a wonderful time to look at a lot of open clusters and things like that, you know, as well as the ring nebula in 57 and the dumbbell 27. But there's just a lot of wonderful stuff up there near the northern, what they call the northern call sack. So uh, that's what sort of I was advertising. And that's what I will take the eight inch uh, telescope to uh, mainly on Friday. Ken won't be there, it turns out. He's actually in Hawaii. Okay. So. You have the key to the observatory out there. Oh, I yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. She's referring to as an eight inch refractor on the side of the 24 inch refractor or reflector. And it's a fantastic. Uh, performer. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other thing, Jerry, is that, you know, you know, that 24 inch is wonderful scope. It's an RC, but it, it's a research scope. And right now, if you want to show the folks anything near the top of the sky, they break their necks. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because, because that thing is adjusted for, you know, camera focal planes, you, you can't use a right angle on right. it. So, <laughs> so I tend to just keep it shut. And just, uh, I use the uh, eight inch telescope. Uh, and people so, are impressed um, just seeing the 24 inch, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's a research scope. I've used a lot, you know, variable star research, but it's, it, it's not, to me, it, uh, it's not a public scope, you know, that refractor is a killer. It's really nice. Yeah. Well, what happens if you put a video camera on the big scope and put the output on a screen? Yeah, I like eyeballs. <laughs> video, video cameras are usually only 640 by 480 so well you get high def ones but anyway yeah yeah and well, it's a very narrow a, field of view then you need a laptop and yeah so you mentioned the summer triangle mm -hmm. and yep. that's one of our talking points today i've outlined it here on the <laughs> yeah it straddles the plane of the milky way right now oh, yeah you can see the milky way scooting through here and uh, the blue lines show the triangle of the summer triangle. Mm -hmm. So um, what do you have? Vega, Deneb, and Al Air mm -hmm. down here. And, and the reason these are the brightest stars up there, and it's an easy asterism to find to orient yourself. Now, if you have a go-to telescope, you don't need this kind of stuff. But I think the magic of the sky and night sky is knowing the constellations up there. You look yes. up there, see old friends. So, it, it, Terry, if I might connect to that, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Uh, so, what I've also been encouraging on these little write-ups I do for Scott is for folks to bring their binoculars. So, some of the um, objects that are up, you know, tip of the sky, top of the sky uh, during viewing time are just phenomenal. I mean, that thing is just dusted with Milky Way dust. You know, stars. But also some of the things that are really interesting too are too low for the telescope, okay? And so I encourage people to bring binoculars so that they can look at things in Sagittarius and you know Scorpius in that region too. It's a wonderful spot to look at things on the deck there, okay? And, and up again, by the triangle, you'll have the uh, coat hanger. You got it, Chuck, yeah. 
Yeah. Coat hanger. That Rocky plus also knows Rocky. Well, not the swan, but you know. But each of those three stars is in a separate uh, of three different constellations, aren't they? Yes. Mm -hmm. So yes. go ahead, Jerry. I just wanted to point that out. That oh, that's I mean, it. By, by uh -huh. binocular use yeah. at these star parties. It's been a lot of fun. Well, okay. I can't see the name. So tell me where Altair is, Vega is, and uh, Denim. Al Altair is right here. Oh, okay. The bottom one. Right. Um, Vega is up here. That's the brightest. It's part of the constellation of Lyra, which is the subtle trapezoid. Okay. And then Deneb is over here as the tail of the Cygnus, the swan. There's its two wings, ah. its long neck with its beak of Alberio. And as a rule, asterisms are not portrayed as anything other than what you say it is. That's a triangle. I mean, it's not the center of a bear or a swan or. A... It's an easy because these stars are so bright. It's easy to see the triangle. So uh, your eye, the human eye, tends to pick out patterns, and this is a pattern that jumps out to you. So it has a name, but it's not official like a constellation. Got it. It's like the teapot. Yeah. <laughs> And, the, and it's right overhead, directly up, well, southeast, west. I didn't get that written down, I don't think. Where south is it's it? kind of down and to the right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There you yeah go, too, too low for the scopes, uh, Ron, in, 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 some, in, in a very special way. So uh, I'd love to have kids look through the refractor, right? And, but right. man, you have, to, you have to go up a big ladder when the objects are far south, you know, far, far close to the horizon. Oh. And, Gotcha. It's kind of dangerous. It's dangerous. So I just snuff those out. So the binoculars are coming in as a rare. You really broke up, Tom, for some reason. Okay. Uh, did you not hear that, Chuck? Yeah, you really broke up. The whole, the whole last sentence was a goner. Hey, you dropped out. Oh, I, I was going to say, you know, one of the reasons uh, I encourage the binoculars is now that a lot of interesting stuff is in the South. Okay, and out of the reach, if you like, of um, the, uh, you know, the refractor at Westmont. Uh, I, I don't like to see people climbing up a ladder uh -huh. uh, to look at something that's uh, down close to the horizon. So binoculars are, it was really fun. I started doing this in advertising this back in the July outreach. My problem then was people were not wearing masks. And so I got the heck out of the dome and just went out on the deck with the mask and just gave a, you know, with my green laser, just mm -hmm. showed people where some really neat stuff is, you know. Now like Chuck said, the coat hanger is going to be up there. That's going to be really pretty. Last month, it was Ponyatovsky's bowl. I had people, you know, they saw it, you know. That's neat, fun. Now, this summer triangle will be, it's not far in the south. It's directly going to be directly overhead at some mm -hmm. point in the night. The southern stuff you're talking about, of course, is the center of our galaxy in Sagittarius yep. and Scorpius. Mm -hmm. Yep. But do we lose this in the winter? Six yes. months from now, it's not going to be easy to see this in the evening. Right. Right, right now, Ron, the, the Milky Way, okay, stretches from uh, the northeast to the southwest, okay? And at the top of the sky, you get, you know, the area containing Cygnus. It's just a wealth of stars and clusters and things, okay? And, and Cygnus is just setting at Christmas time, so. Yeah, right. It looks like a cross. <laughs> yeah, right. We, is that Andromeda? Yeah. Whoa. This is this is a photograph. Um, I don't think the moon and Andromeda are in this position, but they might be. No. This shows the moon for size, and this shows okay. Andromeda for size. This is actually the size it is in the sky, but it's so faint, you would never see it like this. Yes. But this is to show you that a lot of the objects that we look at are not tiny they're not little m57 is little but a lot of the galaxies m33 is big like this um m31 which this is the andromeda galaxy is very big it's something like eight degrees from end to end and the moon is half a degree across but this is how how our sky would look or one part of our sky would look if we had much more sensitive eyes our eyes are plenty sensitive. It's the background light pollution. When we were at uh, Hollister Ranch, gee, it was probably a decade ago now, uh, it was the end of the evening. Chuck, Pat, and myself were there. 
and all the lights were out and it was dark. And I looked up and you could see all of Andromeda. It was just, I got goosebumps. It was, you don't, you know, that's a almost a one in a lifetime uh, thing you can do. You'd have to get out in the desert to be able to do that. Oh, nice. it's big. It's big. Mm. It is big. Anybody know how fast it's coming at us? It's going to be here in about 5 million years. So it's a million light years away. Two and a half million. Two and a half million. Okay. So it's two and a half million into 5 billion. <laughs> well, well, 1 billion into 5 billion is 5,000. So, um, well, I won't have to go out and buy a smoke detector. Fascinating. Yeah, this will be in light years per year. Uh, okay. it, in your notes, Mr. President, you mentioned something called uh, New Andromeda, magnitude five. Is that a star or is that That's a star? Else? Yes. Is it in this? Okay, that was your. Oh, no, this picture is just a, a standalone object. I, it's a neat photograph that illustrates the size of the two objects. And it, it's totally false. It's composited right. in Photoshop. It's not anything real. Right. Right. Because the moon will never be there. Right. <laughs> Well, is, is there a constellation named Andromeda? Yes, yes. yes. Andromeda. Andromeda. And yeah, that's the possessive. Uh, well, that's, that's the coming uh, galaxy. That's not a constellation, though. Is it? It's is a it? constellation, too. It is. The Andromeda galaxy is really called the Great Nebula or the Great Galaxy in Andromeda. We just shorten it to Andromeda. But here it is on a finder chart. There's M31. It has a couple of satellite galaxies, M32 and M110. Mm -hmm. now, over here is the, the is the north is the pole star Polaris, and here is the W of Cassiopeia. Oh, all line right right through the middle of it. Then you land on Mirac, and Mirac is on a, a line halfway between M thirty three and M thirty one. And that's the that's the mental path thing or pattern that I look for to move my telescope manually to show this to um, interested astronomy fans. An, an interesting matchup, Jerry, that uh, Steve O'Meara talks about is the ghost of Mirac. So if you have a you know reasonably nice telescope, uh -huh. that's real large, you can see this very distant galaxy that looks like a little fuzz patch, uh, way 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 in the distance compared to Mirac. Yeah, it doesn't show on this finder chart. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Steve O'Meara has an ability to um, see phenomenal things. He claims I think he's he, half owl, Jerry. He, what's that? <laughs> I think he's half owl. Half owl. We were looking at M13 one time, and he was the docent on a trip I took to Hawaii. And we were up on the side of Mauna Kea at, at the dorm at 8,000 feet. And we were looking, they supplied us with 10 inch um, need telescopes for the event. And we're looking at M13 in Hercules. And of course, there's a galaxy behind M13 yep. and off to the side a little bit. And he it's said, I want to point out to you, there's a galaxy there. And everybody says, yeah, yeah, we see that off to the right and stuff or off to the left. I mean, and he yep. says, no, no, not that one. That's the easy one. <laughs> there's another one that's partly in the cluster, looks like. And that one was tough to see. That's and he neat. asked, you know, do you, someone was at the scope and he, he said, do you see it? And he goes, yeah, well, and he said, if you hesitate before you say no, that means you see it. <laughs> well, Optimism. The, <laughs> the ancient uh, astronomers thought they were nebula, didn't they? they? When did we learn they were galaxies? They, they used the nebula word nebula like we use faint fuzzy. Okay. And Messier even gave it a number, didn't he? But he still thought it was a nebula when he gave it a number, right? He wasn't well, sure what it was. But yeah. Nebula just means cloud. Whenever they saw something fuzzy, they called it a nebula. So it is yeah. a nebula, yeah. but now we know it's a galaxy. As they okay. develop telescopes, and, and Messier had a telescope, a lot of these faint fuzzy things were resolved into clusters of stars. And for a while, they assumed that everything would resolve that way. You just didn't have a big enough telescope. Hmm. And Ron, it was only about a hundred years ago that we realized that this galaxy was outside of ours. There right. was a huge debate in the early 20s. Okay, so are you saying it was Hubble? 
know the sort debate of. couple, uh, Hubert Curtis and Help Me Chuck Chapley, the, the yeah. two gentlemen that were arguing and arguing. One of those guys was at Wilson, Mount Wilson. The other one was at Mount Hamilton. Yeah. At the time. And it, it was pretty much Hubble resolving a Cepheid variable in the Andromeda galaxy that, that started to put an end to the idea that those were part of our galaxy. Yeah, he made right. the first accurate S uh, distance S to Andromeda. Well, yes. not, not very accurate, but, but very <laughs> large. It was precise, but not very accurate. Yeah. <laughs> well, Whittemore was lamenting the fact that people have to climb a ladder to see through uh, his telescope. That's how William Hubble did it, didn't he? Pretty oh, much he was even that. worse. He was sitting in the, in the cage for the primary at Palomar. Right. It was and, and I think he, was, he, did, he did his work at the 100 inch on Mount Wilson. And he was sitting at the uh, uh, Cassegrain focus, I think. Yeah, yeah, smoking a pipe. <laughs> yeah. But when he wrote on the uh, negative VAR, they already mm -hmm. knew it was a galaxy. They just didn't know about no, the bit shift. They did no, not no. know it was a galaxy. Oh, no. he, so it came with him and the Wilson. Interesting. Wow, only 100 years. Yeah. About 100 years ago. Yeah, I think he. He wrote the variable thing and maybe it's like 1925 and I think he published around 27. But I yeah, know. people were debating, you know, until that. I think and it was 1917 when he when he resolved the Cepheid, but it, it, it 1920 was when they were sort of settling that because they started to see the yeah. red shifts too. Yeah. 17 was when that thing was dead, you know, was opened mm -hmm. up, you know. Yeah, and that's the first year of it. Mm -hmm. But now the red shift was only on the side of Andromeda going away from us, right? It was turning in the oh, other direction. Red, red shift yep. is a generic term for, for shift either way, really. But it yeah. wouldn't and have the same red shift as all those distant galaxies are flying away from correct. us. It, it actually has a blue shift, Ron. Yeah. Okay. It's but coming it's towards us. Coming How towards did he get us. that That it wasn't the Andromeda that gave him the red shift theory? The That's conference? correct. No, he right. surveyed after Andromeda, he surveyed all of the galaxies he could right. identify as galaxies, and he just started matching them up and estimating their distance. And he noticed that the farther away ones had greater redshifts. Right. Moving faster. Yeah. Well, I've often wondered, and I've never had it explained to me, whether the really distant, the farthest away, 13 billion plus, would they slip even past red and into radio waves and the radio television? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. That's why we have the James Webb looking way, way, way out in the infrared. Right. right. And there have we have the um, also the satellites that looked in uh, microwaves and see the mm -hmm. microwave background. That that has shifted uh, all the way into microwaves. Yeah, and don't ever past forget radio right? waves. Yeah, don't ever forget us. Thanks to a woman that he was able to make that statement. Henrietta Leavitt. But all the radio waves, like the radio station we were on at, at a one time, are below the color spectrum, right? Including red. Oh, way below, yeah. Way below, okay. Fascinating stuff. Longer wavelengths. Bruce, you got anything you want to add? No, I'm looking at M13. I've got a number of pictures of it. I didn't, I, my, my, uh, uh oh, here is too close in to see a, a background galaxy that, uh, Sixty two oh seven is is the one I show, and that that's one Jerry mentioned was the easy one that Steve Steve O'Meara said. This other one I think I have seen before, Jerry, but only in the powerful telescope. Yeah. Well, this is this is retrograde we're seeing now, isn't it? Yeah. Well, retrograde loop of Mars. Yeah. This is uh, as you know the um, planets move west to east, or am I getting it backwards? Um, they move across the sky and then they stop. They move back from prograde to retrograde and then they stop and then they begin moving forward again. Now, when astronomy started, um, it, it was really all they could do was before telescopes and all they could do was really measure positions of objects in the sky, mostly stars. And they made these measurements with large um, things that looked like protractors called great. Um, what, is, what was it? Uh, quadrants. Quadrant, thank you. Um, it was a section of a circle marked off in degrees. And so they measured the altitude and the time it crossed the meridian in the central part of the sky. And so from that, they developed the right ascension and declination system. 
for stars and they recorded the, of these things. The most complete, extensive and accurate uh, type of data like that was taken by a guy named Tycho Brahe. And uh, he, he, had, he just took all this data and he didn't interpret it um, at the time. But a lot of other astronomers had worked out, they could see with an AI, they could see the retrograde and prograde motion. And at the time that they believed that the Earth was the center of our solar system, this motion is very difficult to um, calculate and understand. And so they had developed a system of cycloids, very complicated math to do this or to figure out the patterns and estimate where they were going to be in the future. But taking Tycho's data, a guy named um, Kepler. Kepler, thank you. Go on. A guy named Kepler um, was able to take the data and he spotted, he realized with Copernicus's claim that the sun was the center of the galaxy. He worked out from this empirical data, he worked out an empirical description of the data in a solar, a sun-centered system. And he called these three things, he developed three laws called Kepler's laws. They're just empirical descriptions of the motion. They don't discuss uh, why it moves that way or the physics of it. It's just what you see. And um, the three laws I articulated there, but I don't have a, let me see if I have a copy here to look at. I can read them to you if you want. I've, Thank you. Please uh, number, number one law, a planet's orbit is an ellipse with the sun at one of two foci. Or foci, foci. right. Okay, you're going to need to explain that in a minute. Number two, a line between the planet and the sun sweeps out equal intervals of time. And equal areas and equal time. Equal areas, equal areas and equal time. Oh, okay. Equal areas of uh, not intervals. I wrote down intervals. Why would I have written that? Interval down? is time. Area. So if you have a, a planet that's in a very elliptical orbit, when it's far away from the sun, it's a narrow triangle, but it's long. So its area is the same as when the planet is close to the sun. It's a fat triangle and short. Okay. And the third law is. The square of a planet's orbital period is proportional to the cube, that's three times, the length of the semi-major axis. axis of its orbit. Right. right. And that's not three times, that's cubed. It's cubed. cubed. It's yeah. to the power of three. So these three laws, again, were an accurate description, a mathematical description of the motion. And they permitted, they gave uh, credence to the solar-centered um, solar system and but they allowed a simpler way of calculating future positions and motions and stuff do you have room hey, for a, do you have room I for a bad think. astronomy joke go ahead yeah. Yeah. okay so um tycho initially was associated with the king of denmark and the king of denmark gave him an island mm -hmm. to, to to use and to set up an observatory so it was the island of havain h-v-e-t-n and he did all his observing there with his big quadrant mural, which was a whole wall that this quadrant was put on. So he could do these accurate observations, but he really kept tight watch on his data. He didn't release it to a lot of people because he wanted to be the person that discovered something from all this data. Eventually he got into a dispute with the King of Denmark. And so he moved to Prague in Czechoslovakia. And that's where he kind of teamed up with Kepler. Mm -hmm. And Kepler was really interested in getting his data but um, Tycho was being very protective of it. And finally, Tycho died and Kepler uh, sort of finagled to get his information and was mm -hmm. able to come up with these laws uh, of planetary motion. And so, uh, so what we say is that uh, Tycho didn't die in Havain. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Jerry, would you mind going back to the previous? I just wanna make a point and then ask Ron a question. Uh, so uh, one thing I noticed here was these were the data from 2003 when Mars was awfully close. Yes. Okay? Awfully close. Uh, another thing I wanted to point out was that you see that it does the loop the loop in about you know roughly three months, okay? You see it coming in in July and kind of swinging out in October. You know, it's, it's three or four months of loop the loop, okay? I have a question for Ron. Okay. Ron? Go ahead. 
why is it the case that Mars doesn't do like a straight line loop to loop, but you actually see a belly to that loop? Why would that happen? You see, it has a belly, you know? Well, uh, it seems like our, our point of view is above its own little ecliptic or whatever you call its plane. Okay. Uh, does that have anything to do with it? I'm sure. Yeah, I'm so basically our orbital planes do not coincide. Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah you got it. Okay, 100 points, Ron. <laughs> You're but, buying pizza next uh, meeting. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's asking you why doesn't it stay in a line? Just go up straight, then come back, repeat the same line, then go up. Right, ahead. right. Because you're looking down on the, on its uh, yeah. motion, and, and that was a spectacular apparition of that. Uh, it was. Yeah, I I took my uh, four inch NP one hundred one and I I uh, went to Taos up in the hills where it was very clear. It was just wow. clear and and well, hey, Jerry, you want to see what a more primitive person did? <laughs> Me? Yeah, I had my homemade eight inch telescope racked up to a few hundred power. Okay, and I drew all that stuff. I drew oh. pictures, so I still have those drawings. And that was cool. that was we had a big public observation at uh, Ealing's Park. Okay, and we had twenty three telescopes and like four thousand people showed up, <laughs> and they were parking down Las Positas and walking into the park because the park was completely parked up. That's neat. And so the fire department and the CHP came and closed everything down because it was too <laughs> dangerous with people walking on Las Positas. Yeah, that was before I joined Westmont, uh, about four years before. But I understand Ken Kilstrom had tons of folks, tons of folks. And you know that old observatory, Chuck. Yeah, he yeah. Tons of folks looking at Mars. Chuck, so this is, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say the outreach is over the past few years really plummeted. Did they not, uh, McPartland? Yeah. And now they're coming back slowly. We're picking them up again. Gotcha. Yeah, it came back relatively rapidly. I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're if if we did the same pace we did last month, we would have sixteen thousand people this year. Wow. And a normal year is twelve to fifteen. Wow. Well, the museum's letting people inside. Is are we looking at a? Sometime in the fall, maybe we'll meet again. That I meant to ask you about since I missed the business meeting um, Saturday night. Did you decide on a new starting date for maskless meeting in Ferran or for not? No, no. I mean, it all depends on 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 COVID. So, yeah. OK, well, we'll discuss it next. <laughs> business meeting. OK, so this is an explanation of what you see as the retrograde prograde motion changes based on Kepler's uh, discoveries that were, or rather Copernicus, that were solar centered. And this is, for example, the Earth, and it's moving in a faster orbit. And this is, for example, Mars moving in a slower orbit. So at first you see it against this, the stars here, then Mars moves slowly to P4, the Earth moves rapidly to T4, and it makes it look like Mars is down here. Then the Earth actually catches up to Mars. You see it here. So it's looking from here to here. It looks like Mars is going backwards because we're passing it. Identical to when you pass a car on the road relative to you, it looks like if it's going slower than you, it looks like you're, uh, it's going backwards relative to you. And then once we get around here, um, then it's starting to move forward again in, it, in its appearance. Okay. Oh. Uh, can you stay? Can you stay on that one more time, Jerry? Yeah. Let me jump back to that. All right. Um, I need to know. Yeah. Enlarge it and tell me once again. The sun's in the middle. Then the first ring is a T. Is that us? Yeah. That's the Earth. Yeah. It's any object that's moving faster in its orbit. So it's a, a kind yeah. of orbit closer to the the center. All right. So P would be Mars. What yeah. is A? What is A? Where's A? Okay, that's going. So, that's so, the so apparent Ron, position of P. Right, right. Yeah. T is like terrestrial, P is planet, and A is apparent. Oh, oh, that's just the, what you see, where they are in the sky. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so and does, a, does this apply to all planets, the inner ones and the outer ones? All, all the outer ones appear to go retrograde at some time. Well, appear to make a loop like that. Right. E even the ones that are going to take 200 years Uranus and Neptune? Yes, but they're much smaller loops, of course, because they're much, yeah. much farther away. Yeah. Mars is by far on the most dramatic. 
Okay, but it's a different uh, system when you're talking Mercury and Venus, isn't it? Yeah, they don't do this. Uh, of course not. They're in there. They're in there. Heck, right. faster. If you were on those planets looking back somehow, and Earth might do a retrograde, right? Well, if this one, if you were on those planets looking at Earth, like on Venus, well, say Mercury looking at Earth, too many clouds on Venus, then you would see exactly the same thing. Earth going backwards for a while and then forward again. Well, we okay. see we see the inner planets like Venus. We see them whip around, and here's um, inferior conjunction, and then around to the greatest extent, and then back to superior conjunction and on around. But we'll never see a crescent of Mars, right? No, we do. We yeah. do well. Right? Yeah, <laughs> right that's a very there. fat crescent. Right. Yeah. But not a full face. Right. right. Not a full face. Uh, did Copernicus, uh, who came up with the heliocentric, meaning sun was in the middle and screwed everybody up, did he know that about this retrograde or did it drive him nuts too? I don't know. Hmm. Yes, he, Copernicus, he Copernicus knew about retrograde motion. He did. Yes. But but Kepler was the one that formalized it and gave us our Isaac right. style. Right. Yeah. C Copernicus had a problem in that he was still dealing with circles. He didn't realize the orbits were ellipses. Oh. He was also a mystic. <laughs> yeah. Because Copern Copernicus didn't have this vast empirical table or database that Tycho had generated. It was a gold mine of data. And Tycho was the first person to sit down and, and actually synthesize information out of the data. But, and then, yeah. when, then when Newton, about 50 years later, when Newton came up with his uh, three laws of motion and the universal law of gravitation, then we, for the first time, people had a mechanism. They knew not only that it obeyed Kepler's laws, they knew why it obeyed Kepler's laws, because Newton supplied the mechanism. Well, we're mostly circular. I mean, uh, they're not close to it. If we, if we were in perfect circular orbits, would there not be a retrograde? Is that what you're saying? No, no there would be. Yeah, there still would be. But the two <laughs> foci and an ellipse, they would merge into one centroid of the circle. Foci is plural of focus? Yes. Right. Interesting. <clears throat> Boy, if you were to do a diagram featuring not just us two planets, but all eight of them, it would really look like a jumble on the <laughs> diagram. Well, that's, it? they make they make a mechanical computer of that called an orary. How about the quadrant? How did it work? The quadrant was like a big section of a um, compass, or not a compass, a protractor. And yeah, it was 90 set, degree part of it. Yes, and it was set in the ground uh, so that uh, you were looking down the line of the meridian. So whatever star passed over the um, centroid you got the height of it at the time that it passed the meridian. Okay. So a lot of our stuff were, were named and numbered in their order of their right ascension because of this, because they were first cataloged with um, a meridian, a quadrant meridian. Later they had, um, what do they call those? Transit telescopes, where they measured it much more accurately using a telescope instead of a trans instead of a quadrant. And you can think of this, Ron, as a as a sextant, a bigger sextant, like navigators use, right. but planted planted it firmly. Hmm. You suppose the people searching for and finding exoplanets have also found that they are all going in the same direction. Is there any solar system or stellar system out there where maybe some planets are going clockwise, right next to one going counterclockwise? Is that, would that be possible? That's possible if you capture something, but that's a rare event. Is it? And fraught with danger. Yeah. It's like someone driving on the wrong side of the street. <laughs> this little graphic illustrates Kepler's laws. Uh, this, is, this is the ellipse that's a generalized orbit. This is another ellipse as a generalized orbit. There's a focus here, which is the closest point to there. And there's another focus here, which mirrors that one over here. And the planet, when it goes around, because this is the one that has mass, when the planet goes around, it travels faster here, because as Bruce pointed out, the triangle that it would make in a given time is a fatter triangle. 
and it sweeps out this area in the same time that sweeps out this equal area. But the area of this triangle, this is a much longer triangle. So this part of it is much, uh, it takes the same length of time to go here as here. So the object is moving much faster as it's close to this focus than it is there. Well, heavens, we don't have ellipses that big and crazy, do we? Comets do this. Mercury yeah. kind of does that a little more yeah. than the others. If you look at the the, the stuff that got, um, who's that lady at UCLA that got the Nobel Prize in physics or stuff? Andrea Gez. Yeah, Andrea Gez. She had taken, for 12 years, she had taken, um, using radio telescope array, she had taken movies of stars moving in the very center of our galaxy. And they were obviously in, in the very elliptical orbits, and they were going around some object that we couldn't see that wasn't there. But as you came, they were in literally in orbits like this and even more eccentric. And that you could see them as they come around, they go around here and they just go real fast there. And then they take a long time to go through this part of the orbit. So there are orbits, not in our solar system, but there are orbits like this for stars. Um, but like I say, comets and asteroids will do this. Well, there's got to be a difference in mileage uh, between the closer in of our little elliptical. It's got to be around 93 million, right, miles from the sun, but it doesn't extend this wide and buried, does it? In other words, what this would is it not be? a faithful representation of the Earth's orbit. The Earth's okay. orbit would be on this scale would be a circle. If this okay, this is exaggeration of our solar system we're looking at here. It's a generalized statement yeah. of Kepler's laws. In a, in a perfect circle, the F1 and F2 would be the same spot. Right. But I believe one of those uh, many uh, conditions of having life that we talked about last week, those two new guys that came up with the rare earths uh, philosophy or uh, yeah. one of them was you had to have a pretty close to a circular orbit. Obviously, for her, you got hot part of the year, really hot and then really cold. As you all know, F1. Okay. And at one and planet two. You want to do betel juice before we get out of here? This is great stuff. Aha. I was getting um, emails, not emails, videos from YouTube from some guy that said that it, the supernova had happened, but uh, it's not. It's a uh, red giant decided to burp. And boy, when, it's a super giant. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's a super giant, but it's red. Yeah. And when it has a cosmic belch, watch out. Um, using the good old Hubble and some other Earth-based uh, telescopes, Orion's <laughs> upper shoulder monster star blew its top back in 2019 actually several hundred years ago to 2019. 600. SME stands for surface, surface mass ejection. Mass ejection. And it's the first time we've ever seen the, this, really? It, uh, um, and they made some astronomers think it would, had exploded. This is the 400 year cycle, 400 day cycle. That's normal to Betelgeuse. And it was following that up till a period where it suddenly um, started shooting up or got back on the cycle and then it went real dark. And then it's been wiggling around trying to get back to its old pattern. These pictures up here are not real time pictures. These are il uh, artist illustrations of what this data is interpreted to represent now. And so this is the conclusion they've come to is that this uh, star had done this surface mass ejection, ended up with this very dark spot on the surface and this big cloud of things that periodically gets in the way and blocks the starlight. Oh. They can see that black spot? No, they can't see any of this stuff. This well, well, they, they can sort of, in, and Betelgeuse is big enough that you can resolve star spots on it. But not to this detail. Right. Well, no. would the inner part of the circle of the solar system fit within that orange ball, that whole star? That orange ball would reach out to Jupiter. 
No kidding. Good Lord. Well, then good old Webb is going to zero in on it if it hasn't already. Might be too bright for Webb. Really? Okay. They don't have a way of filtering it down. <laughs> we'll hear from Chrissy. Chrissy Cook and Dr. I guess she's Dr. Rocio Kiman uh, on the night of the 2nd of September. That'll be our uh, next general meeting online. So this is Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse means a demon, doesn't it? Or devil? It means oh. armpit of the giant. <laughs> okay. Well, that video is now gone from YouTube saying that we think it blew up. We're watching it explode. It don't say Betelgeuse fast three times. Yeah. Why? I forgot. That was a movie. Yeah. <clears throat> Something bad happens. Oh, is that the one with Michael Keaton? Yeah. yeah. Well, you get Michael Keaton popping into existence if you say Andy it three Davis. times. Yeah, right. <laughs> Betelgeuse. So, um, outreach coming up? Outreach coming up. Um, Maybe one tomorrow night at UCSB. Uh, we'll see. I'm sort of having trouble connecting with the person there, and they're asking for all kinds of weird insurance documents and things. Um, Friday uh, is, of course, the Westmont observation, and then Saturday we'll be at Kachuma Lake. What's the gopher hole situation at Kachuma Lake? It's still a gopher hole about every three inches, and it's a sand pit. So it's, it's, a, it's a simulated moonscape. I think I won't be there. We didn't have the picnic up there, did we, this year? Yes, we did. Oh, we did. I missed it. No, no, you were there. <laughs> well, you a great memory, but it's short, right? Yeah. <laughs> How do you remember those seven hot dogs? <laughs> uh, a friend of mine I talked to happens to be on the uh, Theater Organ Society board, uh, board with uh, Bruce. Uh, Fred Ziesenhein uh, wanted me to ask about a, a dome that he noticed up behind El Cap, uh, just outside of uh, San Inez Peak on the coastal range out north of town or west of town. Uh, do you know if that's an observatory or something? I, I think that I think that's just like a satellite tracking outlier station from Vandenberg, but I'm not sure. That's what I told him. It might be something else, weather related, but. I and they, they often put radar dishes inside of protective domes, too. So, But as far as UCSB uh, goes, uh, it's called the Sedgwick property, isn't it? Over yeah, that's over the hill. Yeah. Okay. And do they have an observatory over there? Yeah, they have yeah. a big 26-inch scope. Do you suppose that's where they hold their astronomy classes, or is that done in the physics mm -hmm. department on campus? I mean, they use it. It's a remotely operated telescope. Okay, and you've so all been there. Uh, you know, observatory, it, one of their scopes. Wouldn't be a nice, if we ever do get back together, wouldn't be a nice field trip? It'd be nice. Um, it, it's kind of a pain to get up to. Uh, there's not a lot of parking nearby. And um, it's meant to be a, a remotely operated scope. We did have a star party there once, but it was hard to get any scopes up there and set them up. So we usually set up down below where there's a big parking area. And then people trek up to the observatory. By foot, on foot. Got it. And you guys have all oh, been there. There have been some other things there that maybe we didn't sponsor, but they were sponsored. Yeah. A big dinner there once. and uh... But it's not another Mount Wilson necessarily. It's not that big. Speaking of uh, a school telescopes, uh, Tom Whittemore, is it this coming Friday, Westmont? Right. Yeah. Set up, I think it's at seven, right, Chuck? Yeah, drop yeah. by and look through the eight inch. Uh, yeah, set up is seven because the... Westmont webpage says we start at seven, so people show up early. So even though it's still bright for another hour and a half, we're we're there. Even though we'll be heading into fall in a month in September for the second Saturday board meeting, you want to give an estimate of the time we'll meet outside the Palmer Observatory at the museum? Oh, Chrissy has already set the times. Um, Just so we all know. September. I'll write this down. Yeah. Right. For September, again, the, the, the meeting will be at 6, and the star party will start at 8. Good. Okay. All September right. 10th. Then did we'll... the, did a, excuse me, did the laser thing I made for you work well? Very well, Bruce. Thank you very much. I made some more of those aluminum uh, 
front pieces. Yeah, no, it's it's excellent. We missed the Tuesday night uh, workshops. They're gone, aren't they? No, no, we still hold them. Oh, they're still there. Tune okay. in. We don't record them. Oh, but they are on Zoom tomorrow night. They are on Zoom tomorrow night. And uh, you must be present to be a present. <laughs> Jim Crawford was supposed to be there Saturday night. They said he was on his way, and we he was, was there. Oh, well, he did show up. Yeah. Jim was there. Yeah, he spent the whole night there and oh, hobbled he, his he way home. For, <laughs> I hope. Yeah, and he's listening to us now. Is he? Well, good for him. Thank you. And I hope the day comes, Chuck, that you won't have to put that Ukrainian flag behind you. It'll be over. I hope so. Yeah. Gentlemen, let's do it all again in a week. Uh, have a good trip to Westmont. And thank you. Take care of your wives and your kitties. And we'll see you on Monday of next week there. Thank you very much for the Astro. Adios. Astro. Thanks.